Hi, welcome to Quantum Mechanics 1. The goal of this module and of the following one, Quantum Mechanics 2, is to introduce you to the basic notions of quantum theory. Quantum theory is very important because it describes essentially all uh, of modern physics. As you certainly know, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there are a series of phenomena that uh, could not be explained with the standard classical physics. The most important ones are the existence of spectral lines in the emission or absorption of some light sources, radioactivity, as was discovered by chance, the black body radiation that describes the thermal radiation of a body and that is this peak that could not be explained again by classical physics, the photoelectric effect that describes the emission of a, an electron when a photon hits a metallic surface, and it again had a behavior in energy that is unexpected, and also the behavior of specific heat at low temperature where it was observed to deviate from the classical prediction that is a constant. Around the beginning of the 20th century, people started finding phenomenological models that can describe these phenomena. Planck in 1900 famously fit the black, uh, black body radiation curve. In 1905, Einstein made a model of the photoelectric effect. And in 1907, the same idea applied for the specific heat. 1913 is the model of Niels Bohr, the atomic model. And well, radioactivity took a bit longer to be explained because it's the first phenomenon where nuclear processes were involved. Then all these went on for a couple of decades until in 1926, independently, Schrodinger and Heisenberg produced a mathematical formalism that was immediately proved to be actually the same, two versions of the same mathematical structure. And this is what is called quantum theory. And this is what you're going to learn in this class. Now, starting from these, quantum theory was applied to a huge variety of phenomena to the point that, as I was saying before, essentially all of modern physics relies on it. So we can move here. And uh, obviously, yes, it explained all that it was supposed to explain, namely the behavior of the nucleus. But these led later to uh, what is called particle physics, or high energy physics, where uh, these uh, subnuclear particles have been uh, uh, discovered. Or the physics is done at CERN, for instance. Also, the nuclear physics is the basis of the energy of the stars. So quantum theory is very important in astrophysics. It explained why the, at the behavior of the atoms, why molecules, why those molecules form chemical reactions, light. This gives rise to what is called AMO, atomic molecular and optical physics, and chemistry. It explained the solids, structure of the solids, conductivity, properties like magnetism, so everything the semiconductor, superconductor, and these kind of things. So all of condensed matter and material science rely on quantum physics. And more recently, even quantum physics itself was used as a basi basis for quantum information processing, or also known as quantum technologies, things like quantum cryptography and quantum computing that you hear very much nowadays. Now, we cannot take lightly uh, this fact that classical physics fails to describe some phenomena, because classical physics is the physics based on our intuition. So these phenomena that cannot dis be described like that will necessarily have a counterintuitive element. And to describe counterintuitive physics, we will have also to use known immediately obvious mathematics. This is a very important point to keep in mind for this module. Nature is counterintuitive. And the price to pay is that the theory will also have to be a little bit counterintuitive. Now, let me present to you one of these counterintuitive phenomena distilled out of many years of experience and of experiments. Let us start with this experimental setup. It describes a source of some particles. You can think of photons, of neutrons, of atoms, electrons, anything. These particles, one by one, for, are sent following this path onto this object. This object is a beam splitter or a semi-transparent mirror. So something that transmits some of the particles and reflects some of the particles. And the particles arrive to some object that we call a detector or a counter that essentially makes a click when the particle arrives. Of course, this is a very idealized situation. 
but let's keep with this. Now, if one runs this experiment with, and sending many particles one after the other and reporting the clicks, you find sometimes the click here, sometimes the click there, and after sending many of them, you can reconstruct that the probability of the particle being reflected and the probability of the particle being transmitted are identical, let's say one half. So far so good. You can think what determines whether the particle is transmitted and reflected, but let's leave this question aside for a moment and let's move to the next experiment, which is a just a more complicated version of the previous one, where now after impinging on the first beam splitter, the particle will have to impinge on a second beam splitter. So now we have four paths. This one would be twice transmitted, is transmitted here and transmitted there. This one would be transmitted here and reflected here. This one would be both reflected, reflected here, reflected here. And this one would be first reflected and then transmitted. Now, if we do this experiment for the specific type of beam splitter I have in mind, there are different types, but again, let's not enter into these details. You would find that the probabilities are one quarter for each path. One quarter, one quarter, one quarter. One quarter. And this sounds very intuitive, right? If there is a probability one half here and another probability one half here and there, the product, independent events, probability one half times probability one half is probability one quarter. So, so far so good, it seems we understand what these particles are doing, although we still don't know what determines the path that a particle takes. But now let's move to this setup. This setup seems to be a folded version of these. Look at the two. Here there's a mirror, there there's a mirror. So here we have the transmitted, transmitted, transmitted here, transmitted there, we'll end up here. The reflected, reflected, we also end up here. And the other two paths obviously end up there. Now, if you were to infer the probabilities of this setup given this one, you would say, well, transmitted, transmitted were one quarter. Reflected, reflected were also one quarter. So this should be one half. And the other half should then end up there. However, when the mirrors and the beam splitters are arranged in this setup, what you actually observe is that the probabilities are one and zero. All the particles that come in from here exit there. You can take your time to think about it. This is extremely counterintuitive. And there is worse than that. So let me say you the, tell you the whole picture. Suppose that in a way or another, I can change the path of this particle, putting some more mirrors. So now there is a difference in path, delta L. You may think, well, this should not change much in the probabilities, because I changed the path of this particle. So the, the particles that take this path see a slightly longer path, but they don't know, because they have not seen the other path. However, it does change the probabilities. The observation is that this will be something like cos square of delta L in some unit, and sin square of delta L. And now this is even more surprising than before. Because suppose that delta L in that particular unit is pi over 2, then you will find that all the particles arrive here and no particle arrives there. Which means by changing only one path, I can change the, the fate of all the particles. There is only one possible explanation for this, is that these particles that were indivisible, remember, each one is detected once, but these particles explore both paths. They can compute differences. This object, this uh, experimental setup, is called a max zender interferometer. At some point, we will do a tutorial with the quantum formalism to study it. However, for the beginning of this class, instead of studying this particular phenomenon, 
I will propose you other phenomena that are described in this book that uh, is available for you from the library, so you can uh, use it online. And uh, we will study some chapters of this book where we learn about phenomena like quantum cryptography, quantum teleportation, and the violation of Bell inequalities that are somehow the basis of the counterintuitive quantum world. Yes, yeah, so I am adopting a, an approach in which I put you straight in front of the counterintuitive features. And I hope that this will pay off by showing to you that the effort you have to pay in this class in order to learn the mathematical formalism is worthwhile. 